What's well, everyone? Happy Thursday. Welcome to another edition of the Locked on Penguins podcast. To start off today's show, we're going to continue our season reviews with another fourth liner and someone who I am a little bit excited about heading into next season, assuming that he does come back. That's coming up right after this drop. Your Locked on Penguins. Your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am, of course, your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at NWS Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms. So let's jump right into it. Continuing our season reviews. I know we took a little bit of a day off on Wednesday, but we're chugging along here with the forwards. Let's jump into Ryan Paling. And I didn't think much of him when he was acquired in the Mike Madison for Jeff Petrie deal. I kind of thought he was just like a throw in a little bit, just, you know, fourth line guy. It's kind of what he was this year, but also at times I really liked what I saw. And it was unfortunate that his season was cut short, only played in 53 games. He was nursing that back injury. He, he, I think he said it was start of the season. It was bothering him. Came back, came out of the lineup, did the same again. It just happened all throughout the season, to be honest. So he was battling that injury all year. Hopefully he's close to 100% right now or he's on um, the mend for it. But seven goals, 14 points in those 53 games. He came close to what he did last season when he was in Montreal, 57 games, nine goals, 17 points in 57 games. I think if he was fully healthy, he definitely would have had double-digit goals. I think one of the goals of the season for the Penguins was honestly that one against the Capitals, <clears throat> what was it, late mon- late March, early April, where he went backhand, forehand over Darcy Kemper. Just a really beautiful effort from Paling. And, you know, it looked like he was – a little, at least a lot closer, 100% there with the burst of speed that he had, his finishing ability. I, I liked what I saw from him down the stretch. Um, underlying numbers wise, I thought this year, you know, so so he played about almost 500 minutes of five on five ice time when he was on the ice. The Penguins had 49.6% of the shot attempts, 15 goals for, 19 goals against, 53% expected goal share. 48% of the scoring chances, 51% of the high danger chances, only 40% of the high danger goals for, shot 6.2% at 5v5. So a little bit of a mixed bag in there, fourth liner. Um, I think part of that, you could some of the struggles you could put up to Jeff Carter playing up with him, just because Carter, I think, sunk. Everyone, Danny Shirey actually had a beautiful piece on Jeff Carter today for DK Pittsburgh Sports. Uh, go check that out. You know, he really show what the Penguins options are with him next season, you know, where they have honestly no choice, but to probably play him on the fourth line, but it was a really good article, but Paling, he's still young enough where I think there is more to give when it comes to this player. I have gone on record numerous times on this show. And I have said, if I were the XGM, I would take out most of this bottom six and replace them with new players. That said, I have a couple exceptions. I would put Jarrell Connor. I think he's ready for full-time action. Jeff Carter, they're going to have no choice. My main thing is, you know, is Ryan Paling, you know, it, should he be back? And I am going to be on the side where I think he deserves another shot, whether it's a one or two year deal. I don't think they're going to sign him to like this ridiculous extension or anything in North Shore. I don't think it's going to be like three years max. It'll be two. I think he made what, 750K this year. That's basically league minimum. If I had to guess, he's not going to get much more than that, considering he only have 14 points. Maybe a raise up to 900K, 950K, at most a million, but I don't even know if he's going to get that. It's it's going to be a pretty cheap contract. If they give him a two-year deal, maybe it's two years, 1.8 million total, one year, 900K, something along those lines. It, it's it's cheap depth, people. Yeah, that, that, that's all it is. But you know, I liked his defensive impacts. When he was in the lineup, I liked his offensive ability. If he can stay healthy and get over these injuries, I do like for him to score double-digit goals next season. And honestly, while I'm at it, now the Penguins don't have Teddy Bluger anymore, I think he should be their fourth-line center. You know, why not? He is a pure center by trade. He can play on the wing, but he is a center as well. Carter, 
I understand they like him for his faceoff ability, whatever. He can play on the wing at this point. It's, great. it's the final year of his contract. He's probably going to retire after this year. Anyway, I would give Paling a run at center and see where it goes a little bit. You know, I think they're probably going to flip flop between him and Carter. But in all likelihood, I think Sullivan will probably start Carter at center. And obviously they'll figure out what to do with the third line center. I already discussed that. But I think they should give Paling a test run there because I, I liked what he was doing at center when he was there this season. The underlings were pretty decent. And I want to see him, you know, get a nice sample here, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 games, something like that. And Carter, he's been effective on the wing when he's been here, even though he's really struggled the last year, year and a half. He's, I think he is still more effective on the wing. I, I you know, face offs, whatever. I don't really put too much stock into that, honestly, but Paling can win. He, he can win the face offs. I, I don't really mind it too too much but his defensive presence is good he can play he can kill penalties he's good at five on five i would give him a run there and i would bring him back i think at the least you have to look at three new spots in your bottom six for next season if they don't decide to bring paling back it has to be four but if i were the penguins i would bring him back and see what he can do on a cheap one-year contract there's little risk involved if you do bring him back on a one-year 900k contract if it doesn't work, you can you can stick him in the press box. It's it is not a big deal. Is anyone really going to get mad if a player making 900k something like that is in the press box? No, it's not. It's not as bad as when Ron Hextall signed Kasperi Kapanen to play in the bottom six, and he gave him two years, 3.2 million per season after struggling the year before. It's not like Bronk McGain when he got a four-year contract and he was done for a little over a year and a half into it. So. That's what I would do if I were this next regime. I know the Penguins will have no loyalty to really, I mean, the new regime, I should say. They will have no loyalty to really anyone on this roster. But when it comes to paling, I would bring him back on a cheap deal and I would feed him some fourth line minutes. I would start him at center, see how he does. If it doesn't work, you can obviously move him to wing. He played pretty well on the wing this past season. You know, he he worked on a line with Archibald Uh and Carter at times. I also think O'Connor was on his line at times too. So I, I liked what I saw from him during the season. It's just, can he stay healthy? That's my biggest thing when it comes to him heading into next season. But that's my season review for him. I, you know, it's kind of like an incomplete grade. I, I give him maybe a B minus, C plus, something like that. I don't know if that's super generous or anything, but that's what I would give him. Overall, I, I, I like him. You know, I, I was impressed with him when he was playing, and I think he definitely has a little bit more to offer to this team for next season. Again, cheap contract. Let me know your thoughts. Would you bring Ryan Haling back from the bottom six? Let me down. No, let me know down in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, you can also send me DMs on social media. If you're on there, just let me know. What, what do you think of Ryan Haling? So that wraps up this first segment of the Locked on Penguins podcast for today. Coming up in the second segment, we are going to discuss a player who I think could also be a Jason Zucker replacement if the Penguins opt to not re-sign him if he's out of their price range. And it's a player who has been linked to them before. It's not JT Miller, but it's someone who's been linked to them before. So stick around for that coming up after this commercial break. But before we jump into it, we do have to discuss game time. There are plenty of times where I've been stressed out about trying to buy tickets. For example, the Chicago, the Blackhawks game, This you know, to end the season for the Penguins, tickets were a bit much, but I was able to get them you know, a little last minute, thank goodness, the Steel Panther concert. So game time, that's where game time comes in. It's the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you will have. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. You can get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and so much more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NHL for $20 off. 
Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, I'm back here on this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter, Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at Elmstar Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen of the day. We're free and available on all platforms. This is your team every day. So let's jump into this player who I really think the Penguins could go after because he's out there. And that, my friends, is the one and only Connor Garland of the Vancouver Canucks. No, I am not going to let the Canucks and Penguins trade rumors die. I will let the JT Miller talk die because that is not going to happen with a new regime in there. I don't think they're going to go after Brock Besser. His contract is a bit much, but I do like Connor Garland in terms of a replacement for Jason Zucker if the Penguins cannot re-sign him. He's appeared on the Penguins radar before. It's been reported they've been interested in him. They haven't been able to get a deal done. He's 27 years old, makes 4.9 4.95 million this upcoming season. If the Penguins were to acquire him in a deal and let Jason Zucker walk, they would be saving, in terms of that cap hit, about 500k less than what they were paying Jason Zucker for this season. I think Zucker, he will, pro- you know, he's going to ask for a raise again. I keep saying this on the show. He's going to ask for more money. If he wants to come back here, he's going to have to take a little bit of a discount. Obviously, I and so many of you would love to have Jason Zucker back on the scene for next season. But if they can't agree on term and money, I do think Garland is a pretty steady option for the Penguins. You know, especially, you know, I know Vancouver shopping him, but he has been pretty productive since getting to Vancouver these last couple of years. In 2021, 2022, 19 goals, 52 points in 77 games. This past season, 17 goals, 46 points in 81 games. Pretty decent production. If you want to compare that here to Jason Zucker's production, it, it, it is similar, you know, especially, you know, this season, I know Zucker had the goals, 27 goals, 48 points in 78 games. So, again, the production, it's been pretty similar. Zucker's had more goals this season, but Garland's had a little bit more assists. But the production has been nearly identical. So you could do a lot worse than someone like Garland. You can put him in your top six next to Evgeny Malkin and Brian Russ, assuming Brian Russ is here. There's been there's probably going to be some trade rumors regarding him, but I also don't think he's going to get dealt just because he just signed an extension here. If there is someone in the top six that I would be open to moving the most, I think it would be Rust. But you know, I, I think Garland, in terms of a Zucker replacement, uh, I, I, I'm all for it. You can put him on the second power play. He has decent numbers on the power play from Vancouver. Good five-on-five numbers, good defensively. I think he would be a really sound presence for the Penguins on that second line. And, you know, I know losing Zucker would stink, but a top six that consists of consists of Jake Gensel, Sidney Crosby, Ricard Raquel, Connor Garland, Evgeny Malkin, Brian Rust, that is still potent. It's lethal, if you want to call it that. It's one of the best top sixes in the league. Could you argue that it's a downgrade from Zucker? Yes, and it's one that I would very much listen to. I I honestly could agree with you on that. But I don't think it would be a massive one if that's how um, you want to think about it. I I would be all for it. It makes a lot of sense. His numbers this season, look, (sighs) the, the Canucks, his underlying, the Canucks were just so bad this year. That, that's the reason why his underlings were a little bit below. And he played 81 games, over 1,000 minutes at five on five. When he was on the ice, the Canucks had 49.4% of the shot attempts. They had 49% of the actual goals for, 48% of the, of the expected goal share, about 50% of the scoring chances, 50% of the high danger chances. His under, it was He was hovering above break even. If you put him on a better team with better line mates like Malkin, like Russ, those numbers, I think, will shoot up like it's nothing. So I think it would, it would be a great fit if the Penguins do move on from Zucker. And that's that's how they're going to replace him. You look at the free agent market. I am sorry to say, Jens, there's really not much there. Tyler Bertuzzi, he's going to cost a fortune. You're going to have to look to the trade market. I discussed Taylor Hall earlier on this week. I think he'll be a good fit here. I know some people don't, just you know, his contract and – you know, his numbers could go down, but I think, you know, playing next to Evgeny Malkin and Brian Russ would still be really freaking good. He was playing third line minutes for at times in Boston. 
He also scores at a little bit of a higher rate than Zucker. That makes sense. Garland, numbers are almost identical. Plays, you know, can play either wing position, left-handed shot, good top six winger. What's not to like about? Can play second power play minutes. Trade package-wise, I don't think you're going to have to give up too much to get him. You know, maybe it's your first and a prospect. Maybe it's a second, a prospect, and a player. I don't think you're going to have to give up a ton to get this player. I understand, you know, a second or to third line winger. I would more argue that he's a second line winger. They don't come on trees, but I also don't think it's going to be like this massive package where you're going to have to give up so many futures. You know, if it's like the 14th overall pick and a prospect or something, I would do it. And Garland, and I said this earlier this week, when I would only trade the 14th overall pick for someone that could help right now. He is someone that fits that bill. A top six winger who is still playing well. His contract is not too bad. He makes less than $5 million, And someone who can try to help you compete for a fourth Stanley Cup in this era. That is all that matters. I don't care about the future and all that stuff. That's why I'm a little more lenient about trading this pick for actual help now then just straight up keeping it and be like, I don't care what anyone's offering me. I'm just going to keep the pick. Again, I would keep the pick if, if I can't get someone valuable in return for it. But if I am discussing Connor Garland, I do think the number 14 overall pick should be in play. That's just how I see it. But I think he would be a really good option for the Penguins if Zucker does not come back after the season. Their, big, their priority should be to re-sign Zucker, but it's never bad to have some backup options to say the least. And also, you know, could you imagine Garland on the third line? You know, makes a little bit of money, four point nine five million. It's a little much to be on your third line, but he improves your depth scoring a lot, and he can also bump up into the top six when they probably have more injuries next season. Because I don't think they're going to have the same sort of injury luck that they had this past season, where Crosby and Malkin didn't miss a game. It was rare when Ricard Raquel missed games. Jason Zucker was fully healthy. Brian Russ didn't miss many games. Jake Gensel, they're going to have to have someone that can step up and play top six minutes, even if Zucker comes back. And I think Garland could do that for sure. So I really, really like him as an option for the Penguins. So wanted to wrap up this segment with that. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments or send me a DM. Do you think Connor Garland makes sense for a Jason Zucker replacement? Have he been on your radar for a while? Let me know. Just I, I like talking about these trade targets, even though we're still what? seven weeks away from free agency opening up and then the draft. It's it's never too early to start talking about potential options for this team heading into next season because they, they are going to be very active, especially once they hire a new management regime. So that wraps up this segment. Coming up to end the show, we're going to have some more news regarding Mike Sullivan from Frank Sarvalli, player, Penguin Players in the World Championships, and a couple other things to end the show. So stick around for that coming up right after this commercial break. All right, I'm back here on this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter, Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter, at Emerson Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen of the day. So Frank Sarvalli, Frank Sarvalli, excuse me, earlier today went on a Leafs podcast and I was able to transcribe part of it. Basically, you know, he's talking about you know, Kyle Dubas to Pittsburgh and how he definitely said that the Penguins will be interested if the Leafs bow out here on Friday, Sunday, whenever, especially if the Leafs do, do decide not to bring Dubas back. He also did mention something. I, I did not know this. And I, my, my buddy actually sent this to me in my DMs. I did not know that Dubas is close with the president of baseball operations for the Red Sox. Who owns the Boston Red Sox? Fenway Sports Group. What is the name of their ballpark? Fenway Park. So there you go. I think everyone knew that, but in case some people did not, there you go. So the Dubas connection is very real, but he did have this nugget on Mike Sullivan that I want to say here. And I quoted it on my Twitter. He said, there is a 0.0% chance that Mike Sullivan gets fired in Pittsburgh. If not for maybe John Torella, he is the most powerful coach in the league right now. He also did go on to say that when Mike Sullivan was extended, he was getting twice the money that Ron Hextall was getting. No, I'm not kidding. Go go back and replay the clip. That is how much this ownership group likes Mike Sullivan. I don't think he has Bill Belichick power 
or anything like that. But I do think he is, you know, still decently powerful inside the organization. They value what he says. And it's also why he's assisting the GM search. He's not going to hire his boss, but he's still helping out where he can. He's doing exit interviews, probably helping a lot. Some of the interim guys with the RFA negotiations, they value him a lot. So I understand what Fenway Sports Group said at the press conference. Well, it's going to be up to the GM about the coaching staff. You can put it. I will stamp this right here. If I get old takes exposed, I get old takes exposed. I highly doubt it's going to happen. But Mike Sullivan will be the Penguins head coach next season. And I am fine with that. If a new management group, let's let's just put, let's just put that theory out there. Say a new management group comes in here and you fire him. Probably goes to New York. Who are you hiring to replace him? Truly. Let's go over some options, right? Daryl Sutter, I don't want to play some garbage 1990s trap hockey. Peter Laviolette, offense goes to die in his system. His, If you go to Michael Blake McCurdy's website, Hockey Viz, his teams average less than three goals a game. Hard pass. Mike Babcock, no thanks. It, you're probably just going to hire a retread, and that's why I think a lot of Rangers fans are nervous right now because even though they fired Gerard Gallant, there are not a lot of good options right now. If you had someone like Bruce Cassidy who was an option for the Penguins right now, I would be a little more open to maybe making a coaching change because I think Bruce Cassidy is actually one of the better coaches in the league. But there's no one better than Mike Selvin who is currently out there as a free agent. Bruce Boudreau, okay. His teams are at least a little bit fun to watch, but they don't play any defense. I understand people are going to bring up the blown leads from this past season, but again, you're not going to see a team blow 12 third period leads two seasons in a row. That's just not going to happen. Like he was dealt a really bad hand this season. And don't worry. I have been critical of this head coach on this podcast a lot more than normal this season. I didn't like his deployment of Dumoulin. I didn't like his deployment of Carter. I didn't like some of his other roster decisions because he wasn't giving some young players a chance. He needs to be better with at least a couple of those things next season, especially with Carter, who's going to be back and with giving younger players a chance. Dumoulin's going to be gone. I don't think he's going to be coming back at all. But I also think he needs to be given another shot because a new management group needs to give him his kind of players that fit his system. Sullivan was still a really bad hand by Ron Hextall, and it seemed like Hextall was acquiring players that just did not fit Sullivan's system at all. And that's, I think, part of the reason why this team struggled to make the playoffs this season. There's obviously more other reasons why they struggled, but I don't think the GM and the head coach were on the same page at all. And if you fire him now, he goes to a division rival, which is going to be annoying, and you're going to be stuck with a worse head coach. People will tell me Sheldon Keith maybe as well, Eh, I think he's an average coach. I don't really think much of him. I think of anyone that's available that would come in here, they would not be as good as Mike Sullivan is. Again, I'm not saying, I'm not absolving him of criticism for this season. I'm just saying he deserves another crack at this, albeit on a shorter leash for next season. So there's my little tangent on, a little more of a tangent on Mike Sullivan after what I discussed yesterday and what Frank Cervalli um, said. He also did say they are about to wrap up their first round of interviews. Didn't really mention any new names. So status quo when it comes to that. And we also do have some Penguins in the World Championships, which is about to start very, very soon. I believe it starts tomorrow. Casey Smith, Drew O'Connor, and Nick Menino are on Team USA. Drew O'Connor had a really good game in an exhibition um, just a couple days ago. Two goals and an assist. Really nice job for him. Casey Smith is going to probably get a couple of starts, I think. I think Cal Peterson is the goalie ahead of him, but I still think the Smith's probably going to get a little bit of playing time. Nick Pino is the captain. Congratulations to him. We also have Alex Nylander um, on Team Sweden. P.O. Joseph is on Team Canada. And then from Wilkes-Barre, Justin um, Adamo will be on Team France, which is um, pretty cool. So not the usual guys. I know a lot of people are probably used to Evgeny Malkin playing for Team Russia, Sid for Team Canada, Jake Gensel for Team USA. Gensel, I think, was going to go to the World Championships, but he's nursing an injury, and I actually did not know that he was really hurt during the season. So none of the, the big star players are really going to the World Championships. That's going to take place over the next few weeks. It used to be a lot of fun watching those because the best players would go, but now I think it's just a glorified 
exhibition tournament. I don't think a lot of the top players take it super serious. <laughs> Um, but that will do it for this episode, I believe, of the Locked on Penguins podcast. Really appreciate all of you listening slash watching. I'll be back with another episode for you all on Friday where we continue our season reviews, touch on some playoff stuff. Last I checked, the Devils were up 2-1 to one on the Hurricanes. We'll see if the Hurricanes can come back and win this series tonight or it's going to go back to Newark for a game six. So, again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Let's talk again on Friday.